person next to you and say we're going to push back against our enemies amen verse 13 that last clause it says he shall prevail against his enemies he shall prevail against his enemies he shall prevail against his enemies you ought to, you ought to read that last clause with me he shall prevail against his enemies amen and there are many enemies of the cross in the society in the world in which we live in enemies against the cross and enemies against our lord and if they're enemies of, of the cross and they're enemies of our lord and we love the cross and we love the lord and therefore they're our enemies amen uh, no one should be an enemy of god and and then turn around and be a friend of yours. If they're the Lord's enemy, then they ought to automatically, um, you, we want to try to win them, but you don't want to be in love and embracing the enemies of God. Especially, it's one thing when you're dealing with people who are in the dark. That's one thing. Uh, the, the, it's one thing when you're dealing with the weak. It's another thing altogether when you're dealing with the willful. See, that's another thing altogether. And so uh, God, the, the Lord wants us prepared to deal with our enemies. Can you say amen? amen. Um, maybe I, I'll re I, I want to, I tell you, I want to go back and just set this in context and, and read verse 1 through 9. But I, I'll move forward and... and uh, it, I may end up going back to it, I'm going to be honest with you, because it's, it's just good, good reading. It deals with the Messiah, and it sets uh, the text up. It says, Behold, uh, <laughs> behold, behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. He's talking about uh, the Messiah. Amen. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Here, uh, Isaiah refers to the Lord Jesus as God's servant, whom the Lord upholdeth, uh, mine elect, in whom I delight. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He shall not cry. That is, um, uh, he will not be uh, a rabble. He will not be a rabble rouser. He shall not cry nor lift up his voice uh, to be heard in the streets. And look at, look at the compassion of him. A bruised reed shall he not break. That is a repentant soul who is truly sorry. Jesus won't break them down but he'll restore them. A bruised reed shall he not break. And a smoking flack that is just a spark Shall he not quench? That's why when you're going through and the devil is beating you down and, and you're just hanging on by a thread, have you noticed that the Lord has a way of keeping you? The Lord has a way of putting his arms around you because see, when you're beat down like that, really, you, you, you're a smoking flack. There's just a little bit left. And the Lord says, I won't put that out, but I'll come in and I'll fan that flame to get, you, to get you back up to where you need to be. And I'm glad of that because nobody is on top. Nobody is shouting and dancing and running from point A to point B in the Lord all the time. All of us have times where life gets the better of us. And I'm glad on those times when I'm down. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord knows how to send something or someone to revive me and to cheer me up. A smoking flax shall he not quench. Uh, he shall bring forth judge, judgment uh, unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged 
till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall want, shall wait for his law. Look at his, um, look at the mission of the Messiah. For thus, uh, thus saith God, the Lord. Look at this. Thus saith Elohim, uh, Jehovah. He hath created the heavens and stretched them out. Uh, he's, he that spreadeth, he that, excuse me, created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spreadeth forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people unto it and spirit to them that walketh therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant to the people and for a light to the Gentile. In other words, the Lord says of Jesus Christ, you will, the Lord will be my covenant to the people of Israel and you will be a revelation to the Gentiles to open the blind eyes. And this is so important. One of the things I love about Christianity is that uh, Christianity brings you to the light. The believer is not in dark. That's why a true born-again spirit believer, spirit-filled believer can't join certain organizations, you know. To become, uh, to become a part of some of these organizations, you got to confess that you're a lost soldier in search of the light. Get on your knees and let them blindfold you. And then say you're lost and you're in search of the light. Well, I'm not lost. I'm not, in, I'm not in search of the light. I'm enlightened. I'm not looking for another God to serve. I'm not looking for the way. I'm not walking around here in Raleigh saying, why am I born? Why, why am I here? What is my role? What is my purpose? Oh, no, I don't have those kind of questions. All those questions were answered in Christ. Amen. Amen. Why, why, why was I created? You know, why am I here? Who am I? All that stuff is answered in Christ. He opened the blinded eyes to bring uh, out the prisoners from the prisons and them that sit in darkness out of the prisons. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. We're not going to praise and worship anybody but him and him alone. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and, a, and new things. Somebody ought to grab that right there. New things do I declare before they spring forth. Look at this. I tell you of them. Only God can accurately predict this future. Only the Lord can tell you to a 100% certainty what shall be. What a mighty God. He says, things that happen before they happen, I can tell you what's going to happen. What a mighty God we serve. Then we go into the scriptures that give us our text. And this mighty God is the one who is saying that I will um, prevail against my enemies. If he can stretch forth the heavens, if he knows future events, if he's the keeper, if he's the one that can do all of these things that we just read, don't you think that God can give us power to defeat the devil? Now, with these enemies, one of the most chilling passages of Scripture uh, that I want to, uh, to, to me personally, that I want to call your attention to, would you turn to 2 Peter? Uh, I have so much ground to cover. I'm, I'm, I'm headed somewhere. 2 Peter chapter 2. And, you know, we've talked, uh, we've talked from this particular passage. And 2 Peter chapter 2 and other passages like it are passages that we will find ourselves from time to time revisiting because we are living in the day, we're living in the era where uh, heresies are alive and well. False teachers are in the land. They have privately uh, uh, crept in. And just as there were false prophets, according to verse 1, among the people, that is, among Israel in the Old Testament, he says, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, 
even denying the Lord that bought them. And you know, this particular passage, just for those who love to study the scripture, trip up, this is a, this passage is a, it, it trip up those who believe in eternal security. And they try to pretend that the word bought doesn't mean that they were saved. Well, now the Bible teaches that we're bought with a price. And, and, and the price is the life, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And anyone who, who professes to be blood bought, a, a blood bought believer is a believer who is saved. And the Bible is predicting that there are men whom the Lord bought, that these whom God bought with his precious blood, Jesus hadn't bought anybody with silver and gold. Jesus hadn't purchased anyone with the blood of bulls and the blood of goats because he says that the blood of bulls, the Hebrew writer says, and of goats couldn't take away sin. And if, and if the blood of bulls and goats would have been sufficient, then Christ wouldn't have died in the first place. So if the, he's talking about people whom the Lord bought, he has to be talking about people who at one time knew the Lord. I mean, that makes sense. It connects with all other scriptural teachings with regard to those who know the Lord are the ones who are blood bought. He says here that there are going to be people who were bought by the Lord. Uh, th these, they're going to deny the Lord who bought them, and in doing that, they will bring upon themselves swift destruction. You see that? And the Bible says, and many, this is what's bad, and many, many, many shall follow their pernicious ways. And I'm going to talk to you about this pernicious and perniciousness in a minute, what's, what's meant by pernicious ways. And this is, this, is, this is what chills me. This is what I want to get to. By reason of whom, because of these men and their pernicious ways and people buying into their pernicious ways, destructive, immoral, ungodly ways. And so this, this is predicting that there will be huge mega churches with people who are following the false teachers. Because it says many shall follow. So when we see uh, some of these churches that just spring up in there, you know, you can't, I was saying to the class last night, you can't judge the effectiveness of a church merely by its size. So well, there's a whole lot of people coming. That doesn't mean it's right. As a matter of fact, Matter of fact, it can, it, it, it can be, if you're a study, if you're a, a, a person who carefully studies the scriptures, it can be a reason for you to pay even closer attention to what is being taught. See, we're living in a day now, I was talking to someone today, where uh, there is the growth of the, what I call the play it safe ministries. The Bible doesn't use the word play it safe. The Bible uses the word falling away. The word falling away literally means when the church will begin to shy away from topics that incur the wrath of the world, topics that incur persecution. You know, everybody now is, is majoring in relationships, and this is by no means indicting everybody who deal with relationships, but relationship ministries and stuff like that, these are play-it-safe ministries. They don't offend anybody. You basically tell people what they want to what they want to hear, and we talk about the, uh, how we should all get along, and it's, and it's sweet, and, and that is a part of the gospel. But when that becomes the main thrust and it's more entertainment, everybody's laid back, everybody's laughing, everybody's having a good time, there's no sense of urgency, there's no sense, there's no militancy, there's no sense of duty, we're just, we're just having a wonderful time and the goal of the service is to enjoy it and stuff like that. That is a good, that is an indication that what 2 Peter chapter 2 is talking about is going on. And the Bible says through these by reason of whom, look at this, the way of truth, biblical Christianity, shall be evil spoken of. By way of whom, by reason of whom, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The truth is that these false teachers, they come in different expressions. They have numerous approaches. False teachers can be gifted, attractive people, but... The, the issue is, how do we recognize these people who cause the way of truth to be evil spoken of? Because, see, when the way of truth is uh, defamed, 
when the way of truth is put down, when the way of truth is lampooned, then people turn to ways of error. To every one of us who named the name of Christ, we owe, to, uh, we owe it to biblical Christianity to be upstanding citizens, to be careful how we behave in public, to be careful how we carry ourselves. Amen? Married couples, get along. Raise our children right. Pay our bills. Not cause scenes. Not cause spectacles. The police can't be coming to our house to, to put out the fire. Because when they do, and you've already told everybody in the neighborhood that you're saved, then, then if, I'm being, if, if this is happening in public, I am causing the way of truth to be evil spoken of. And every one of us owe the way of truth a certain amount of allegiance. See, Christianity, we're not just saved for the Lord to bless us. We owe God. I want you to get this. We owe the Lord something. Uh, that, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things I've tried to, to, to say to people about the, the organization, the Church of God in Christ. I didn't invent this church. I didn't, I didn't, it didn't start with me. It didn't begin with me. The church has blessed me. The church has been good to me. I owe the church something. The church owes me nothing. The church produced a preacher who preached me out of my sin. The church produced a preacher who made me want to know Jesus, who made me want to study the Bible, who made me want to serve the Lord. All these things came from the work of the church prayers and the prayers of saints, people uh, of days gone by, Bishop Mason, all of them. Then I came along in 1977. I got saved, and, all, and, it, and it poured into me and wanted and taught me to love the Lord. So in my mind, in my mind, I owe the organization to represent it properly. Now let's move one step further to the cross itself. Jesus Christ who bought me. Jesus Christ who died for me. Jesus Christ who rose again for us. Do we not have an obligation as good as he has been to us? He's washed our sins away. He's sanctified us. He's filled us with the Holy Ghost. He's forgiven us, uh, 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 us of our sins. When we fall, he picks us up. When we're down, he, he shakes us off. Think about it now. When our kids are sick, he's healed our children. When we need him to make a way, he's made the way. Now, the issue is, do we owe him to represent him properly so that the way of truth, his doctrine, is not as evil spoken of by the world as a result of, of our behavior or misbehavior. You're not saying anything. Am I making a, a reasonable biblical argument? Do you have in your heart, and if you don't, I want to create it tonight, a sense of duty to the Lord. I know all of us have shown up, and, and we all have on the, on the you know, right there, right on the, uh, the, the, in our mind right here uh, on the front, the, the main thing we think about is what we have up before him that we want him to do for us. But do we think in terms of what he wants us to do for him? For we are his witnesses. He says you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost and you shall be what? Witnesses unto me. Witnesses. And we are witnesses. We are witnesses when we want to be witnesses, and we're witnesses when we don't. Once you name the name of Christ, you're always, you're always at all times, everywhere, a witness. We determine whether we're a good one or a bad one, but we're always witnesses. And so the question tonight is, what is people, what are people, what is people, what are people saying about biblical Christianity as a result of our lifestyle. When people see you in the grocery store, when people see you at work, when people see you in the neighborhood, when people see you on vacation, when people see you, when people see you, when people see you, they shake hands, they talk to you, they interact with you, whatever. When they walk away, what do they think of biblical Christianity as a result of their coming in contact?
Forget what people think when they, when they see us perform. It's when the performance is over, when the presentation has come to a conclusion, and we walked off the stage, and we're in a real-life setting. What do people, what, what, what uh, do people think? What are people's impressions of the way of truth? The Bible says, because we're going to have these false teachers, and many are going to follow them, and their ways are going to be pernicious, and pernicious literally means, it literally here, pernicious is a reference to debauchery, immorality, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, just evil living. That is, the lowering of the church, of, of, the, of the biblical standard, the lowering of the bar, till we bring these things into the church, almost like that, uh, the, the, the program they had on the other day, uh, the, the celebration of gospel. You know, it's amazing. The gospel uh, uh, singer dancing and grabbing his crotch and stuff like that. And, 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 and you know, that kind of stuff. And, and we're not outraged. It kills the witness of the church. I mean, it just takes the witness of the, of the church and just, just slams it. People look at that stuff and say, if that's Christianity, I don't want it. Or they may look at that and say, if that's Christianity, I want it. So they want that brand of Christianity. So they grab that brand of Christianity, and, they, and you know what they call it? biblical Christianity? Oh, that's traditional. We're not a traditional church. We're not into tradition. See, right now, mother, it's called tradition. Our church, we're a progressive church. Sin is called progression. Progressiveness. Yeah, we're, we're a cutting-edge church. But holiness now is called old school. I'm not into that old school stuff. That's old school. Well, God didn't call holiness old school. God called holiness holiness. And, and the Bible doesn't call sin new school. The Bible calls sin sin. And this is part of what we got to, we got to this is part of the challenge that we got to give to our, to our young people, how to contend with this, the culture in which they, they find themselves in because you got to know how to stand your ground and walk in biblical Christianity. Amen. One of the ways we recognize these people is that they bring in damnable heresies. That is, they teach enough truth to cleverly uh, blend in error. This is why every believer, when they come to church, ought to pay attention. Bring your Bibles and pay attention. So when error is taught, you can catch it because error is being brought in. They deny the Lord. To deny, you know what deny literally means? It means to contradict. Look at the preachers now who are endorsing a same-sex marriage. Look at the preachers now who are endorsing and welcoming homosexuality and all this stuff. They are contradicting Jesus. I don't care whether they're Baptist, Church of God in Christ, Methodist. It doesn't make any difference what political party they're in. If in the name of the Lord, they are saying that these things are now all right. They are contradicting the Lord. That's how you deny him. Deny him is not just simply saying, I don't want Jesus, or I deny that Jesus saved me from my sins. Matter of fact, it's not that at all. It's contradicting him. And look at the churches, the, uh, the denominations. You see Christians marching on Moral Monday, marching in favor of abortion with a collar on. That's wrong. And, and black folk never thought, I, I say this all the time, you never thought you would see anything like that. All of us marching together saying we shall overcome. The abortionist, the preacher, the lesbian, the homosexual, and the Muslim. We shall overcome someday. Overcome what? You're going to hell. That's, 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 that's denying the Lord. And let me tell you something. I, I said this the other day. I want to say it again. You got to know how religion works. Fundamental. The way religion works. Religion doesn't, this is not how it works. You, this is not how religion works. Well, we, we lay aside our differences. That's not how religion works. The differences in religion causes the religions to clash because there's only one true religion. 
You can't have 2,000, 3,000 different ways to the same God, and they're all different, and they're all equally right, but they contradict. Somebody's right, and somebody's wrong. The way religions work, we try to win each other. I don't even try to win my Muslim brother. We just, you know, he's, he's got his thing. I got my thing. What we do, we just work together and we, we adopt, which is a trick of saying what we do is we do good deeds. So now the new, the, the new religion that everybody likes, the one that the news like, is the good deeds religion. So you're, you're all right with ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and all these other news agencies, local and national, if you can just come together and do good deeds so the, the, the Christian and the Muslim are feeding the hungry. What an expression of God's love. They're not letting their religious differences uh, uh, divide them, and, and you just see the love of God. And really, isn't that what religion is all about? Not our differences, but we're finding ways to work together. That's not how religion works. You fundamentally understand what Jesus came to bring, the Lord says, I did not come to bring peace. I come to bring a sword. Praise the Lord. And in every city Jesus went in, Jesus left the cities divided. Because everybody who believed on him really believed on him. And everybody who didn't, they didn't. And the folk who did believe on him didn't get along well with the folk who didn't. Because they, their relationship was one where they were trying to win each other. You don't want anybody to go to hell and be lost forever. So what they're trying to do is redefine how religion works. All the religions ought to lay down uh, their um, differences and work together. The New Age movement says uh, they teach that the, the Christian organization has got to drop this notion of a single Savior. Well, you know what they're telling us? In order to work with them, we got to drop the notion of Jesus Christ. Now, can you, can you still be Christian and drop that? Can we still, can we be, can there be a Christianity minus the cross? Can we be a church and we just, we just omit, you know, Jesus? We, we're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about how to get along. We're going to talk about how to love each other because really, isn't that what life, life is all about? It's, it's, it's all about what you do for each other. You know, what, what life is really all about. I mean, you hear these meaningless platitudes. Uh, it's really about how you serve your fellow man because that's why we're really here. We're, we're here to serve each other. And yeah, that stuff sounds good, but that stuff is false. We're here first and foremost to love the Lord. Thank you for watching God First. Experience this message in its entirety by calling toll-free 877-463. 3477 to purchase your copy in CD or DVD format. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.